It's a new year. Full of new possibilities. New opportunities. And hopefully some new faces. If this is your first visit. Or your first time in a while. We're so happy you're here. Here's a little bit about us. We are just ordinary people. Serving an extraordinary God. We strive to be friendly and welcoming. And can't wait to get to know you. We know life is complicated. So we will work really hard. To provide practical and relevant messages. To equip you on your journey with Christ. We care about this community. And believe it's our job to make it better. We are so glad you're here. Worshiping God with us. Welcome, Welcome to, to our church, church the, the Wings, Wings of, of Love Ministries. Ministries. Waiting can be the greatest struggle. Trapped in darkness, cold and alone. I have no one. Lost and wondering, desperate for a sign. Lord, where are you? Thirsting, silence and finding none. Stranded and surrounded by the rising waters. Endless running but never reaching your goal. Just fighting the temptation to simply give up. In these moments when hope seems lost, Christ is saying, listen for I am calling out. Hold on. For I have not forgotten you. Hold on, you are precious to me. Hold on, my rescue draws near because I will lift you out of the darkness that in the midst of suffering and storms, I want you to know you can reach out your hand to mine and just hold on. Because I'll never leave you, nor will I forsake you. God bless you. Thank you for your undivided attention. Thank you for joining us to hear a word from the Lord, to provoke our thinking, to stir our soul, to change our life, to give us encouragement, to continue to stay on the straight and narrow and to persevere until the trumpet sounds, until our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ come back again. I've been running for the Lord a long time and I'm not tired yet and I hope you feel the same way I do. This is the fourth Sunday and you know inside the sanctuary we celebrate our youth. Keep our young people in your prayers. When you bow before the Lord and go to the throne of grace, do not forget our young people. They are facing temptations. They have their troubles. They're dealing with trials. They're facing hardships, peer pressure, and a number of things perhaps that we don't even know about parents. And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm gonna keep my, my, my children and my grandchildren and the youth of the Wings of Love Ministries in my prayers. We're going back into the church, in-person worship. Uh, well, you gotta pull your pajamas off now. <laughs> you gotta put on some Sunday go meeting clothes or we're gonna, you can come dressed down. We're going back into the sanctuary and I, we're coming back in here with great expectation. And uh, we're coming back in and I'm going to do something a little different, you know, tradition, uh, you wear, or traditional, you wear black and white. Uh, but I'm coming in the first Sunday in April with all shades of blue. Why past the blue? I mean, come on, blue means trust and tranquility. And that's 
the two main ingredients we need. Trust and tranquility. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. All your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. And know, brothers and sisters, those whose mind is stayed on the Lord. He'll keep you in perfect peace. You who keep your mind on him because you trust in him. So wear your blue when we come back in here the first Sunday in April. There are three ways that you can give and we really appreciate uh, your offering. Oh, I mean, I'm thanking you, Wings of Love. If I had 10,000 tongues other than thanking God, I couldn't thank you enough for your generosity, for the gifts. And I pray that your giving will not be in vain. Anytime you sow into the kingdom of God, there's great dividends, great returns. Now, prior to hearing praise and worship, you want to go into praise and worship uh, prior to the sermon, always good to hear a song. Boy, it gives me great pleasure <laughs> to introduce some and present to others uh, my son who has been doing a marvelous job uh, in terms of the tech work. Uh, I appreciate him. Uh, we've been, we have been streaming live and he's done a great job because I'm, I, I'm inexperienced in that area and so I really praise God for his dedication and commitment. Coming down here on Wednesday and then coming back in here on uh, Saturdays and things of this nature, and even on Sunday, he preach himself on the fourth. And so he's coming to bring us a word. The title of that message is Tapping Into the Power That You Already Have. And I'll come back and just share with you on that because you don't preach when a preacher preach <laughs> it just give you something to think about because I mean I know it's going to be sound solid and full of substance now let's go into the sanctuary Amen, amen, amen. Uh, let's give it up to the God that woke us up this morning. Uh, let's give it up to the God that died on the cross for a sin that he never committed. Let's give it up for a God that has blessed us throughout our lives. Let's give it up for God for our health and strength. Uh, let's give it up for a God that we serve on a daily basis, that we've given, that he's given his life for, that we willing to do whatever it takes to get close and connected to him. Let's give it up for the God that woke you up this morning, Wings of Love. Wings of Love, good morning. Pastor Jackson, I thank you for that warm welcome. I'm always appreciative of it. Wings of Love, let's give it up and hit the like in the hearts. Uh, type in the comments, tag them, whatever it is. You know how I am. When I get up, I like to make a grand gesture for our pastor and first lady. Let's give it up for Pastor Alvin Jackson Sr. and First Lady Debbie R. Jackson. Let's make the loudest noise. I know they can't hear you, uh, but make the loudest noise you can in your home uh, as we appreciate our pastor first and first lady. Uh, let's do that. I won't be before you long. Um, let's open up your Bibles to Ephesians 1, 15 through 23. Uh, let's jump right into it. Um, Ephesians 1, 15 through 23. Uh, it reads, if you don't have your Bibles, I'll have it on the screen. Um, Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to Lord who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrote in Christ when he raised him from the dead 
and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. For above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world, but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. I just want to put the topic on this text, tapping into the power you already have, tapping into the power you already have. Uh, listen, real quick, anybody that knows uh, me knows I believe in grasping the attention of someone when you're publicly speaking, whether that's a speech, um, a sermon um, or some type of lesson instruction uh, that you would give amongst people. Um, that the intro is so important that you must grasp the attention of someone. Even when you're going into a relationship, the, the intro is what's important because uh, uh, you want someone to take a ride with you. Uh, you heard um, in another sermon, my wife was talking about how um, I like to guide her and try to show her different things with an intro uh, because we're we don't have the style like Pastor Jackson. And so you Pastor Jackson is going to hop around and jump around. And so what you want to do is you want to grasp that attention when you're uh, up speaking. And so with that being said, I, I hope I don't offend any of you all with this intro. But I just want to simply tell you that you have been selfish long enough. Uh, that's that's the intro right there. You you have been so selfish. You have been bragging that you are so selfless when you have been selfish for so long and you haven't even realized it. Because here it is that God wants to show you a certain thing. God wants to guide you a certain way. God wants to direct your path into this direction, but you don't want to allow it. Why? Because you believe that your way is the best way. You believe that 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 your trainer's way is the best way. You believe that your uh, mentor way is the best way. You believe that guiding uh, your own path and directing your own life is the way. And so you have been going throughout your Christian walk so selfishly that you haven't realized it, that you're ignorant to the fact that I am holding myself back. We have some real people out there who, who know that they have been holding themselves back. But there is also a group uh, that don't believe that they're holding themselves back, that I have all the answers. I don't need any help. I can do this all on my own. You have been selfish long enough. It's so attractive to be selfish. Uh, why would you start your intro off with selfish? I simply started my intro off because you can't tap into the power that you already have if you believe that you are the only way. If you believe that your way is the best way, if you believe that you can get to uh, greatness, if you can get to abundance without Christ, if you believe that, then I'm simply telling you that you're going the wrong way and you're not tapping into the correct power that you should have. He has granted us power and authority, not like any other. But you can't tap into the power that you already have. You can't access the power that you already have and the authority that you already have if you believe and have that mindset. If that if I'm talking to you because I've, I, I'm talking to myself, maybe some of you all are so transparent uh, that you know that you have been selfless. But I have been selfish. Sin in itself is selfish. We have been selfish long enough. God said, wait. And here it is. We're, we're moving on. God says, go. Here it is. We're staying questioning whether we should go. We have been selfish long enough. God said, I will give you wealthy lifestyle and and healthy kids and a great marriage. He said he'll give you and bless you with all of those things. But you said the doctor said I can't have a kid, so I won't. I've been through too many relationships, so how can I have a happy relationship when I've only um, I've deaded all the relationships that I've been in? I want you to understand by the end of this sermon, when you take the ride, when you graduate from the from the car seat, and graduate out of the car seat to the back seat. I want you to jump in the front seat with me because when you get there, we're going to drive all the way to the conclusion and you can get at the end of the day. You're going to tap into the power that you already have. 
We are born to win, not born to lose. This is life changing, liberating truth. So so why don't we experience victory all the time? Let's jump into it. Circumstances arise that discourage people say things that causes us to feel defeated. Haters are all on our back trying to hold us back. We giving them more power than they should already have. We find ourselves fighting a losing battle against unholy desires. Why are we fighting a battle already lost when we could enjoy a victory that's already won? The victory is already won. So why are we trying to fight that losing battle? That's why I can't stand the argument. I just put on my story on Instagram not too long ago. I can't stand the argument of who's the greatest NBA player. Because it's based on your own um, uh, perspective. It's based on your own uh, way of going about basketball and different things in the sport. We'll never uh, put it down to one, whether it's Kobe, whether it's Jordan, whether it's LeBron, whether it's Kareem. It's a preference. What's your preference? So I ask again, why are we fighting a battle that's already lost when we could enjoy a victory that's already won? Tapping into the power and authority that you already have. A lot of us don't see clearly it's it's our blurred perspective that's keeping us from experiencing what God offers. With your new birth came the kingdom authority that fitted you for victory right off the bat. The Bible says, for whosoever is born of God overcometh the world. That even now your own mind may tell you there is a little hope for you. Can I tell you? You should have more than a little hope. You may have been programming yourself that you have already been defeated. Before you go into the battle, you've already said that I've lost the battle. We serve a God who have blessed us, who has equipped us with every weapon, every tool, every prayer, every power, every authority, every anointing that we need to go into the battle and we can claim and enjoy victory before we even step into that thing. What is your perspective? What is your preference? What are you doing in order to tap into the power that you already have? No longer. Can you feel defeated? No longer can you program your mindset that I am defeated. No longer can you be selfish any longer. If you're saying you're defeated, then you're selfish because we serve a God that says you're not. Your head is straight for a self-fulfilling prophecy and you think you lost. Perhaps the best hope you have is that you only can survive. Can I tell you, we have a God, or should I say we serve a God? And matter of fact, I can say we have a God in our life who says we gonna do more, we will do more than survive. There's nothing wrong with uh, surviving and being a survivor, but I'm more than a survivor. I'm a conqueror. I claim victory now before I even go into the battle. I claim victory now before I go into the hospital room. I, I, I claim victory now before surgery even manifests itself. I claim victory now. No matter what the, uh, the what stands in front of me, I claim victory. No matter what's around me, I claim victory. No matter what you're saying, I claim victory. Put in the comments that you're claiming victory. In spite of what's in front of you. I heard of a football coach. And I've, 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 I read this online and I've heard other people tell the story, but it's so relative to what we're talking about. Um, about a football coach who sent out a former player to recruit players for the team. The recruiter asked who was a former player again, what kind of players do you want, coach? He's trying to see what do you want me to go out there and search for? 
The coach responded, well, you know, uh, the man who gets knocked down and stays down, we don't want him. Then there is a guy who gets up when he is knocked down, but when he is knocked down again, he stays down. We don't want him either. But there is a, the guy who keeps getting up no matter how many times he gets knocked down. The recruiter is happy now because he said, I think I got it. I think I got it. That's who you want, coach. Coach says, no, that's not who I want at all. He says, coach, well, who is it that you want? Because now I'm confused before I can even go out there and equip myself with the answers I need from you to be able to find the right person. He says, but I told you about the guy that knocked down and don't get back up. He said, then I told you about the guy that get knocked down and get back up, but get knocked down again. Then I told you about the guy after that. But I want you to get the guy that's doing all of the knocking down. I want you to get the guy that's running everybody over. I want you to get the guy that's knocking people out to where they say I can't get up again. He says, I got all of what I need, but I need you to get that guy because that guy is knocking people out to where they don't want to even get up anymore. And that's the same revelation we should have in our life and in our Christian walk. We want the person that is knocking everybody down. We serve the God that we serve because he is running through everybody on the line. He is knocking everybody down and they can't get back up. We serve a God that can run through any hurdle that stands in front of us. God wants us to have his level of kingdom authority, but we're stuck in ours. Kingdom authority. It governs us. It laws overrule our opinions. And you must know that. If you want the the high level, the correct level, God's level. Of kingdom authority, it must overrule your opinion. It must run your life. It must dictate every single move you make. But that's why I started the intro off with we're selfish because we've been selfish so long. We won't allow ourselves to access kingdom authority and allow heaven to be open to pour out blessings upon us. I want to bestow all that God has for me. But we've been selfish too long. It's divinely authorized responsibility dedicated to us as believers to act on God's behalf. And spiritually ruling over his creation under the power of Jesus Christ. Hmm. In verses 15 to 18, Paul prays that they will apprehend what they have. He says in verse 17. That God will give you a spirit of wisdom, a spirit of revelation He prays in verse 18 that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, which means that you start seeing things as they really are and not as you think they are there. See, again, now I know you probably was lost in the beginning. Like, why is this boy starting this intro off like this, calling me selfish? This is why, because you think what you see is what it is. When God is simply telling you it's something else, but you won't believe him because you're seeing with the natural eye. We've been saying the spiritual uh, realm and the, uh, the natural eye and the supernatural experience and the supernatural mindset. But yet we don't act upon it. It's not the devil that's doing it. It's not God holding us back. It's not our neighbor. It's not our hater. It's not our family members. It's only us. We should pray daily to receive clarity. I hear some people say that I I don't even know what to pray for. Clarity within itself is what you should pray for. God, give me the clarity in my assignment, the clarity within my job, my relationship, my family, my finances. Give me clarity in the the path you want me to take. If you take if you say go left, I want you to to tell me that then I'm going to go left. If you tell me to go right. When you tell me that I'm going to go right, if you tell me to stop, I'm going to stop. If you tell me to stay, I'm going to stay. I I, I need you, God, to direct my path 
and give me the clarity within my assignment that you have commanded, demanded for me to do. You have discerned for me to do something great and I want to obtain greatness. So God, give me the clarity. The eyes of your heart may be illuminated is what it says to see clearly what this authority that you possess. The end of verse 18. Which are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? He says, I want you to understand how rich you are in the spiritual realm that you have inherited by virtue of your faith in Jesus Christ. There is not a poor person here spiritually. As far as your inheritance is concerned, you're not poor. But again, here it is. You're looking at what's in front of you, that you don't have any money, that you're poor. But spiritually, you're rich. So if we're spiritually poor, then that's because you are uh, at the wrong bank trying to make a withdrawal. OK. You don't you don't believe me. I, I, I hear somebody out there uh, like, no, Minister Jackson, you can make a withdrawal from another bank at the ATM. You might can't go in, but you can be at the ATM and you can be at uh, Fifth Third and go to Citizens and still make a withdrawal. Yes, you are very right. But guess what? When you make that withdrawal at the wrong bank, there's a three ninety nine fee. That's attached when in turn make you lose more in the long run, because now, like trustee Stan Jones say, I have to pay to get my own money out. You crazy. So, yes, you can withdraw from the wrong bank in the ATM, but there is a fee you must pay. Keep serving the devil. Keep allowing the devil to direct your path. Keep living in sin. Keep living in your own way. Keep saying that you have um, power and authority over your own life and not God. Keep allowing yourselves to dictate in which you will go in order to obtain greatness. Keep allowing that fee to hit you because you're going to lose more in the long run because you're going to get charged a three dollar and ninety nine cent fee just to get your own money. And just like that, the devil is just luring you away because what he offers you is so much easier. But you're getting hit with fees just to use your own power and authority. I don't mean to drift off, but some of you are OK with that. But I'm not OK with giving uh, God or should I say giving the devil what's mine and allowing him to take what's mine. But I want all of it back. Give me what I'm owed. Come here, Ty Tribbett. He said in his song, I want it all back. I want it all back. I remember a story or a situation in my life. Rock with me for a second. Where my bike was stolen. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm a typical kid. You're outside. You're I, I go in and get something to drink. I come out. I leave my bike wherever it is in a walkway, in a driveway. Uh, I, and I go in one time and I, I get something to drink, come back out. My bike is out outside. Um, I ride it up and down the street. I'm, I'm tired and hot again. I, I get thirsty, go back in the house, get something to drink, come back out. And now there is another kid on uh, my bike. And so being a naive kid, not understanding, living in the hood right off Seven Mile in Greenfield, um, I said, yeah. He asked. He said, can I ride your bike? I said, yeah, go ahead. Don't no, no, no problem. Here it is. We, we live um, facing east. And so he he goes and he takes the bike and he turns right, which would be south. And so he's going right and he going south and he turns right back around. And he's coming back and now he's going north. But only problem with now he's going north. He, he continues to go north. He goes one block north and then two blocks north and then out of nowhere he vanishes and I can't even see him no longer. At that moment, I realize that something isn't right. And so I run into the house and I tell Pastor Jackson and First Lady, um, I, 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 this guy, this boy, this 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 person outside has taken my bike. I, I, he's stolen my bike. I, I don't know what to do. And just like. Side note, your first lady and pastor, something wrong with them because they got right on the phone and called trustee Stan Jones and our uh, minister, Chris Jones, 
uh, and, and out of nowhere, and I, I believe some other uncles and people came by. They came by right when they got off work. And so now to fast forward the story, we go and we're looking throughout the neighborhood of Seven Mile and Greenfield uh, trying to find Little Al's bike. Um, and so we're finding we're looking in, in the houses. We're looking um, on the streets. We're looking in the backyards and cars spread it out. And we find my bike. Finally, uh, my bike stood out because I had um, something that identified it as my own so I can spot the bike anywhere. But the difference with this bike, it has now been spray painted pink. The bike is spray painted pink and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what's going on. But just like I told you, Tad Tribbett says, I want it all back. Um, Uncle Stan, Uncle Chris and my father is now going into the person's backyard without even knocking on the door to take my my bike back. Um, my mom's knocking on the door now. She's saying uh, your whoever it is stole my son's bike. And not only did I get that pink spray painted bike back. But I got a bike within the same day. And so now I got what was old to me and something new. And just like my bike and just like Pastor Jackson, just like Trustee Stan Jones, just like Minister Chris Jones and my mom, First Lady Debbie Jackson, got my bike back. God says, I can get all of what the devil stole for you back. I can get that and more because what the abundance that I have for you will overflow just like my word says. But you got to stop being so selfish and believe that God is going to get you out of any circumstance, any situation that stands in front of you you got to believe it tapping into the power that you already have I already had a mother I already had a father I already had uncles and so when my bike was stolen I tapped into the power that I already had and that's how I was able to obtain all what was stolen from me and more you got to serve God truly when you do that watch what he do for you I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to drift off on getting things back, but I felt like that was for somebody that's out there right now on YouTube or Facebook Live who says, I want all of it back. I hear preachers and other singers say, I don't want what devil stole from me. I want new stuff. But I'm telling you, I want what the devil stole from me and I want what God has for me. Merge them together. and Then I got abundance. I got overflow. I just want it all back. He says, I want you to see how rich you are spiritually. As believers, we focus on when we die. We want to wind up in the presence of the Lord. I, I, I know that's one of our biggest things. As believers, we want our conclusion to write servant well done. I know that's what we want um, at the end all be all. But nevertheless, in route to heaven. God wants you to know that there are riches and rights, uh, privileges that you can benefit from on your way to your eternal destination. Uh, don't just live down here like oh, I'm going to heaven that I won't obtain what God has for me. But while I'm waiting on God to come back, I want it all back. And what God has for me, I want extra. Paul says, I don't want you to go to heaven to see how powerful heaven is. I want you to be enlightened now about the rights and privileges based on our relationship with Jesus Christ. You don't have to wait to the conclusion. You can obtain your promise now. I want him to say serving well done as well. I want to be able to make it into heaven. Matter of fact, I don't want to. I am going to make it into heaven. But again, while I'm waiting on that day, give it all to me. And so, God, remove any of the selfishness that I have in my life. Remove any of the selfishness that whoever's watching against Facebook and YouTube right now that we will no longer be selfish and allow you to come into our lives. Not temporarily, not momentarily, but permanently, eternally, that you will live with inside of me and it will show and manifest throughout my life. He says, I pray that your eyes may be enlightened. God wants us to know that there is more in there to be experienced. He says, I pray that your eyes would be open. That you will become more wise. In fact, he says in chapter one, uh, verse three, you have already been blessed with all spiritual blessings. 
everything God is is ever going to do for you. He's already deposited. You already have it, but you have to obtain it. You have to be patient enough to get there. You can't keep throwing in the towel uh, uh, year after year saying that you're not going to be great. You're destined to win. Your promise is victory. The victory has already been won. He goes a little bit further. If you look at verse 19, he says, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power. So he doesn't just want you to see his power. He wants you to watch how he demonstrates his power. Watch how God show himself off. Watch how God manifests himself in your life. Watch how other people that said you couldn't be great. Watch how they help you become great. And they don't even understand how they're helping you when they don't even like you. He wants to manifest himself so great that you can't say it was nobody else but God. So he doesn't just want you to see his power. He wants you to watch how he demonstrate his power. That's why in verse 20, he says he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. Far above rule, authority, power and dominion, every name that is named not only in the age, in this age, but in the age to come, not only in this time, but in the time to come, not only in this moment, but the moments to come. What kind of power God wants us as believers to experience here is is resurrection power. He wants you to see the power that reverses things, takes things that are dead and make them alive. Take defeat and literally make victory. Who wouldn't want to be a loser when people are pointing at you, loser, loser, and then you obtain victory and people will say, how did you become so victorious? How did you become so great? How did you become so rich? How did you become this person that I always want to be around or be like? How did you get out of that dark situation? How did you come from the mud and become so great? He take losses. And wind them up to be gain. He fed 5,000 with just a little. So imagine how he can feed you, just little old you. He wants you to see how he can come into your life and shake things up. That's a great God to serve that wants to come into your life and shake everything up for the good, to shake everything up for the better. To shake everything up because what he see in your life, he needs uh, to fix it and change it. So when someone else is looking at your life, they will now come to you. And when you begin to tell them how you got out of your situation, that's another life, another soul that is saved. And now you have brought somebody into the kingdom. So when you're obtaining your kingdom authority, you're bringing people with you in eternal life. You have to understand that 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 mindset. Resurrection is changing the natural order of things. He wants to come into your life and literally change the natural order. I was built to win. I was built for greatness. I was built to do this. So there it is when I tap into the power and authority that he has given to me that I already had. I didn't have to search for it. I didn't have to look for it. I didn't have to call nobody for it. He says, I grant you and leave you with power and authority. So let's go a little deeper. When he raised Jesus from the dead, he says that Jesus being raised, seated him at his right hand in heavenly places. Jesus rose on Sunday, then ascended 40 days later. Jesus Christ is now seated in the spiritual realm, in the spiritual realm, ruling over the throne. And he sits high and above. It says in verses 21 through 22, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Verse 22. And he have put all things under his feet. Um, before I can even finish verse 22, can I tell you if it's under his feet, that means he's stepping on it. That means you can't even overcome it. It's under him. 
under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. How great is it to serve a God that can't be overruled because everything he rules over is underneath him. It's under his feet. That's the problem. And that's why the intro was what it is and why I keep referring back to the intro of you being so selfish that you don't even understand how you're selfish. It's under his feet. So don't talk to me about that, that you don't have victory already. Don't talk to me that you can't win this race and win this war. And he is so powerful that he can't be and won't be overruled. Because while uh, or should I say, while he can't be overruled. Any attempt to overrule him, he can reject because he sits above whoever they or them is. That's the problem I have with you right now. Whoever I'm talking to, you've been saying they said for so long and gave they so much power that we don't even know who they are. But he sits over they and them. So who it is that says you can't rule. You tell them I serve a God that rules over all. And if he rules, I'm connected to him. Therefore, I rule. He rules over they and them. He wants our eyes to be open that you've got this wealth available to you. To experience his power and that his power is demonstrated in the person of Jesus Christ. I need you to understand you got the greatest cheat code there is. Back in the day, I used to play the game. And we used to have this book called Game Pro. And in Game Pro, the magazine, that's how you know how old I am. And I know I'm young and 37, but magazines don't almost don't even exist today. But in Game Pro, in order to get certain finishing moves for Mortal Kombat or to get to the ending real quick, Game Pro had cheat codes. And you can go up, up, left, right, back, back, forward, forward. Game Pro had the cheat code. And so when I wanted, when I, when I kept being, look at this, Wings of Love, when I kept being defeated and so frustrated with Mortal Kombat that I couldn't get to the next level, I went to the cheat code in Game Pro. And I was able to get to the next level and I didn't even have to fight the war. I didn't even have to fight the battle. You got the greatest cheat code there is in Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for every sin that you committed and haven't committed already. So here it is. You got the cheat code, but you won't tap into it. Put in the comments, tap into the cheat code. Tap into the cheat code. He wants your eyes to be open. He wants your eyes. To, it, it literally says some some um, uh, text says open. But I like when it used enlighten. It's enlightened. He wants them so bright, as bright as the lights that's shining on me to my left and my right. He wants them open. He wants them open for two reasons. One, he wants them so open that you're connected to him that you can defeat and overcome anything. But he wants them so open that when the devil tries to come and distract you, pull you away and throw things your way, that they're so open you won't fall to the temptation. It's a left and a right. It's an up and a down. It's a north and a south. We make the Christian walk so much more than what it should be. You either going up or you going down. You either going right or you going left. Either you're staying or you're going. Either you're going to serve them on one side and stay on the other side. You can't serve both. You can't live in both. We make we, we make it harder than what it should be. He wants your eyes open. Hebrews chapter two, verse 14, which says that in Jesus in Jesus's death and resurrection, Satan was defeated. It's already defeated. So it's just like I said to you in the beginning in the intro. Why are we trying to fight a war, fight a battle, fight a fight that has already been defeated and not enjoying the victory that's already won? Sometimes you have to look into your own life and, and slap yourself on the head in confusion to say, no, why, why, why was I acting? I was tripping. Sometimes you got to tell yourself that you was tripping. I believe Pastor Jackson used to tell me all the time, you when you don't know how to pray, just talk to God. So, so you should just go to God sometimes. God, my, my fault. My B, I was tripping. You do got all power in your hand. 
I, it was just a moment where I was tripping. Snap out of that moment and not make it a lifestyle. If it's a moment, that's one thing. If it's a lifestyle, I'm praying for you. You cannot be defeated by Satan unless God allows it. That's why I preached that sermon years ago. That it has to cross his desk. And I might have to bring that back one day because it has to cross his desk. If you understand just in that in that topic, in that title, that everything that comes to your house has to be approved by you. Not a paint job, not a new roof, not a new car, not a new doorbell, not a new dish in your house. Nothing can come to your house if it's not approved. Here it is. The devil think he's so high and mighty, but he still got to get permission. Why would we succumb to a devil that has to get permission from a God that we serve? Look at the pecking order of it. We're fearful. We're living as if the devil is here, but we serve a God who act as if he's here. This is how we act as this God is just right here. Because he can't get us out of this situation. There's no way I'm in crazy debt. This this darkness that I'm in is so dark that no light can shine through it. We put him here, put the devil here because oh, no, no, I don't, Minister Jackson. Here it is that you do. Well, the, the devil, he he he's been busy. When I just talked about the cheat code, but I also just talked about that it has to cross his desk. Here it is. If it has to cross his desk, then the pecking order should just be this in itself, because God has ruled. And I just told you it's under his feet. It's all in the text. He rules over everything. Everything is under his feet. He got up and rose with all power in his hands. The only one that has truly defeated death. But we act as if the devil has so much power. Again, I tell you, it has to cross God's desk. Any trouble that comes your way, do know it was either God ordained, I said this to you in another sermon before, or God allowed. That's it. Don't beat yourself up so much that you give the devil way more power than you. I didn't mean to even drift off on it has to cross his desk. I need you to understand, Wings of Love. Put in the comments, it has to cross his desk. When you're going through that moment, in your life where you confused or ready to throw in the towel. Just remember that title. It has to cross his desk. The Bible says he took away the power of death. So Satan now must trick us to defeat us. He literally has to come up with some trickery. Not only permission, he got to come up with some trickery. He can't just overpower us to defeat us. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, he can't just overpower us. That's why he wants our eyes open. That's why he wants our eyes enlightened that Satan is now under Jesus' feet. Look at chapter two. I know I said chapter one, verses 15 through 23 is our text. But look at Ephesians chapter two, verses four through six. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loves us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace, ye are saved and have raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Paul is praying that we understand you're here. But you're not here, here. You know how us black people like to say I'm hungry, but I'm not hungry, hungry. You're here. But you're not here, here. You're not really here. You have been relocated spiritually, even though you are physically located right here or where you are right now. Because if you are saved, you have died with him, were raised with him, were seated with him in heavenly places. This is not Minister Jackson's word. This is the Bible. The problem is you are seated with him. In heavenly places, but you are operating from an earthly mindset. So you may be functioning, but your locality is misdirected from its correct path. Here, I'll say that again. The problem is if you're seated with him in heavenly places, but you're operating from an earthly mindset, then yes, you may be functioning. 
but your locality is misdirected from its correct path. Basically, as Pastor Jackson has said before, you are a dead man walking, a dead zombie walking. You're just walking. So, yeah. Oh, I'm functioning. Oh, no, I'm doing OK. Just like I told you before I got to this point, I want to be more than a survivor. That's the problem. We have been hyping up surviving by so, so long that we're satisfied with surviving. But I've survived long enough that I'm no longer a survivor, that I'm a conqueror and I'm an overcomer and that I'm going to obtain whatever it is that God has for me. Fighting tooth and nail to get and obtain what God has for me. But in other words, you're off track to keep it simple. He says, but if you learn to operate from where you are truly seated, you're looking at things totally different. That's why I say he's operating in the truth. He's the spirit, the truth and the light, the truth. Take all of it out for a second. Just truth. He's the truth. Once you obtain the truth, then watch what manifests in your life. But again, I, again, I drift off. You're not here. Or should I say you're here, but you're not here here. I don't think you truly get it. OK. Let's look at at how the world is now. Real quick. We have Zoom. We have Microsoft Teams. We have Skype. We have all of these teleconference softwares that you can be at your job um, in an important meeting while in your living room at the same time. You can be. T uh, uh, talking and visiting people in other states while never leaving the state you're actually in. Because technology has made a way to keep you here while you're still somewhere else. I think that went over your head, as my uncle said, would say, Pastor Jones. Uh, but can I tell you something? Before man even was here, before COVID-19, 20 and 21 came. God had a spiritual system placed in a connection that was with us on in the from the earthly bound to the heavenly bound that says that I have a new location for you, that the location that you're in is not your permanent location. It's just your temporary location that you have work to do. So when you are doing that work, I'm going to grant you with some things that shows my gratification and my gratitude to say that I love you, to say that I just want to bless you, to say that I adore you. But I have an eternal location for you that you don't have to Microsoft Teams. You don't have to Skype. You don't have to FaceTime. You don't have to do any of those things that you can be with me for eternity. And that spiritual connection point us at every direction that we should be in, that as a believer in heaven, I will be. I need you to understand, Wings of Love, before I can even close the text. That the problem is we get so used to the earthly way and the earthly uh, rules and laws and regulations and comfortability sets in that we never connect to the spiritual technology to heaven and wind up with the limitations on earth. How long can we be limited? Earth is limited. Heaven is eternal. So how long can you how long? Listen, you can say you can cut me off. You can be annoyed right now. But ask yourself, how long will I? be limited how long will i not tap into the power that i already have see now i know you were probably trying to wonder how is it that he got this topic with it now you're understanding the topic tapping into the to the power that you already have how long before you tap into that power how long before you tap into the cheat code so you can get to the next level he already did the dirty work but you got to tap into it so stop trying to two time him and think you can get over on God. I will tell you that and I'm done. That when you experience it, <laughs> it's like none other. Pastor says it's like no other high you can get. The happiness and the joyful uh, spirit that you will have. Everybody, I believe all of us have experienced a little bit of it. But imagine when you experience what you're in, whatever it is that's frustrating you now, 
whatever it is that's consuming your life now, whatever struggles and uh, 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 hurdles that stands in front of you for you to get around and over. Whatever depression and anxiety that you're experiencing now, imagine when God wiped that away, how you would feel. The doors of the church are open. I need you to understand, if you don't take anything or grabs anything from the sermon, understand this, allow God to rule over your life, throughout your life, and whatever it is that you do, allow him to dictate it. Because I want to see my brothers and sisters on the other side. But before we get to the other side, I want you to obtain your promise. I want to see you drive the top car. I want you to, to have the happiest of marriage. I want to see your uh, uh, 10, 12, 5, however many kids you want. Whatever it is that brings you joy, I want to see that. It's not just about material things. It's so much more. I'm just naming off a few. Maybe it's just your health. I want they, they said you would never walk again. I want to see you walk. They said that you won't even smile again. I want to see you smile. So as the doors of the church are open, allow yourselves to no longer be selfish in your Christian walk. And actually truly operate within selflessness. Not for man, because you have been selfless for man, but allow yourself to be selfless for God. When he says move, then move. When he says go, then go. When he says stop, treat it just like the red light that you do on the roads and stop. Because if you run through the red light, ain't no telling what will happen. That's why he tells you to stop. That's why the red light is there. Because someone else is coming once their light turns green. So he says wait. As the doors of the church are open, Heavenly God and Father, we come to you now, simply thanking you for being the great God that you are. If you never give us anything throughout our life again, what you have given us is just enough. Long as you never take your hand off of us, we're fine with that. But God, as long as you have your hand on us at the same time, God, long as you have us here on earth, God, Long as you're giving us second, third, fourth, and fifth chances, God, we want to get this thing right. Forgive us for the sins we may have committed. Forgive us for our shortcomings. Give us the strength, God, to overcome our struggles, to overcome our demons, to overcome our strongholds, to overcome the generational curses. Forgive us for being selfish, God. When you told us to move, we didn't. When you wanted to use us, you couldn't because we were disobedient. Forgive us for that, God. Give us the strength, God. In your son Jesus' name, we pray. Wings of love, I love you. I turn it over to Pastor Jackson. Man, ladies and gentlemen, homie and honeys. I mean, that's for my young people. Let me tell you, boy, I call him young Al. I tell you, boy, Minister Alvin Jackson gave a powerful word. Tap into the power you already have. You know, I used to buy my children toys, and sometimes you have to go to the store and go buy batteries. But let me tell you what I did appreciate. I appreciated having the toys that come with batteries. What are you talking about, Pastor? They come with batteries because I didn't have to go to the store to get it because the batteries came with it, meaning that the power was already there. And the only thing I had to do was put those batteries inside the toys that I bought my children. And let me tell you, my brothers and sisters, you too have spiritual battery power. Once you get saved, let me tell you something, you come <laughs> with batteries. Great is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Let me tell you, you have the authority. Minister Jackson was just telling you, you have the authority to overcome the adversary. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. You need to understand that Christ has preeminence over principalities. Mm -hmm. 
He is supreme over Satan and have domination over demons. He has dominion and he dominates. Let me tell you, my brothers and sisters, you have power within you to tap into. Let me get out the way because I already preached. You have, listen now, Exusia. Huh? What are you talking about? Power? That means authority. Dunamis, that means power. Let me give you an illustration. I got to bounce. I got to I got my head backwards again. You know, I'm, you know, my son. He, you know, come on, man. T.D. Jakes and I, we be trying to keep up with the young folk. Listen, a police officer has dunamis <laughs> and exusia. He has power and authority. Matter of fact, he has the authority to carry the gun, then he has the power to use it. But a crook only has power. A crook do not have the authority. A crook can be put in jail. <laughs> he only has power. Satan has power, but he don't have all power. He don't have all power. God has all power. And you have the power. I want you to understand like that crook that only has power. You like the police officer, and I'm out of here. You have authority and you have power. Just learn to take what Minister Alvin Jackson said and apply it to your life, to your living, to yourself and your situation. You have authority and power and keep saying to yourself, I am an overcomer and I will not be overcome because I'm going to tap into the power. God bless you. There are three ways that you can give, and we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Ask the Lord to help you to be good stewards of what belongs to him. We just to, we are to manage what he has, what he has given us. He has entrusted us with talents, with the treasure, and with time. And so, brothers and sisters, sow a seed, and you shall reap a harvest. Minister Alvin Jackson's cash app is on... Uh, on the screen and give him a love gift. I tell you, brothers and sisters, if you give a cup of cold water inside the name, the Bible says you shall receive a disciple's reward. Give him a gift. God bless you. Thank you so much. Let us bow our heads in prayer. God our Father, we come to thank you that you have given the believer, the church, power. Power, oh God, over Satan, sin, and this evil system. Help us, oh God, not to practice sin that would short circuit the power within us. Help us, oh God, to be able uh, to be available and accessible where we can be instruments in your hand, where you can uh, allow your power to work in us, on us, and through us. Thank you for the message that we heard from Minister Alvin Jackson. Bless him, bless his wife, and bless his son. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And thank God. See you next week. <laughs>